motherhood is one of the fastest growing demographics in our nation. If you're not a single mom, you know a single mom. Our guest today, Jennifer Maggio, remembers what it was like to have two small children living in government housing on food stamps, wondering how she was going to make ends meet. She felt alone. Now, she has a national and international ministry called Life of a Single Mom Ministry. She is ministering to single moms across the world because she remembers what it was like. And her goal in life is no single mom walks alone. Stay tuned. This is a great story you don't want to miss. We're here today with Jennifer Maggio. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of Life of a Single Mom's Ministries. Not only that, she has been featured on almost every Christian media you have seen. She has been on the 700 Club. She has been on national radio. She is an international speaker, and you are about to figure out why, because she has a lot to say. Her message is powerful. Jennifer, you know, we've talked before, and you have an incredible early life story, and I want you to kind of start with with your dad. Mm -hmm. When your mom was killed by a drunk driver, he had already suffered so much loss. Yeah. But how, how did, what happened in that moment? I know your life changed just like that. Yeah, you know, um, it's so interesting because the, the older you get, the more makes sense. Um, and I, I find that to be so true. But my dad had lost a son when he was 17 years old. And so... Um, and watched him die. And watched him die. And, and having gone through that, he was born with heart trouble. In fact, both of my dad's sons were born with heart trouble. And so they were in and out of surgeries. And of course, many years ago, the advances in technology weren't what they were today. And so just even that was um, traumatic. And then um, he knew he was dying for about a year. So just walking with your child through that, of course, is difficult. Um, and then um, that consequence, consequently uh, caused him to lose his first marriage. It just was so much on the marriage, the strain. And so by the time my mother was killed, he had already gone through a lifetime of tragedy. Well, the environment for you early in, uh, even before that time, I know you had sexual abuse that started when you were three. Um, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you begin to make sense of all that as you're growing up an adolescent with all the pain. You've got secrets of your own. He's got secrets. You can't really talk about these things, but yet you're walking through them together. Yes. You know, um, I never talked about the abuse until I was adult, an adult. And in fact, um, I never talked about it until my dad passed away. Um, I don't think he ever knew about the abuse. I think that um, the trauma he had experienced really, um, for lack of a better term, kept his head in the sand much of the time. Just survival. You know how we, we are that way. We just try to function. And so um, started being abused at three. Um, and for nine years, I walked through abuse with lots of different um, neighbors and step relatives and family friends. And, um, and my dad was leaving us um, in the care of people that just did not have our best interests at heart. And I think he was naive to that fact. What was high school like for you as, as carrying all that into there? trying to also be accepted. You were smart, you were bright, you had the opportunity for a bright future. Um, you entered into this relationship with this, this young man for seven years. Um, you were pregnant. Um, just describe kind of that season of your life, how again, you've got all this mixed up and you're trying so hard to make sense of life with broken skills, yeah. but yet you're still trying to find some. Going through almost a decade of sexual abuse was one thing, but then there was all of these various stepmothers and the abuses that they brought into the home through their families or themselves. And so uh, being forced to steal and forced to view pornography and, um, and just physically assaulted many times and verbally assaulted more times than I can count. All of those things culminated into a difficult high school year Yes, I was very smart. My issue was never a head issue. Um, and even in that, I think that there was a, um, a level of perfectionism that I sought 
because there was um, value there. And so there was there were teachers that would give me the pat on the back or there were, uh, you know, the high school principal giving me an award gave me some sense of validation. Um, and so it's not any wonder that I was looking for that in relationships. I began looking for value that I was not getting at home um, with my dad and um, various stepmothers. And every time my dad would remarry, which by the way was six times, um, every time that he did, we couldn't talk about the previous mother. And we also couldn't talk about the fact that we had had other mothers um, because we always had to call them mom. You know, you get into those high school years, which are already difficult. Right. I mean, even if you've been parented perfectly, it's right. difficult and you're trying to find yourself and there's this sense of um, longing to fit in somewhere. Right. Um, and, and it culminated in me being a young, pregnant teen mom, but this sense of loneliness and desperation and um, a lack of hope were all things that I was struggling with internally that I couldn't verbalize to anyone or I didn't think I could anyway. When you tell your dad you're pregnant, mm -hmm. he says, have a great life. The night I graduated high school, um, the next morning our family moved out of state. And so we, I can remember coming home after graduation that night and sleeping on the floor because all of our stuff was loaded in the U-Haul. And so he moved um, a state away and I was visiting family and friends for a couple of weeks. And it was during that time I'd already hidden the pregnancy for many months um, to the point to where I couldn't hide it any longer. You graduated six months pregnant. Yes. I don't know how you hid that. Yes. Um, uh, nobody knew. I think there were a few rumors out there, but nobody really knew for sure that I was. And so I called him on the phone to tell him. And part of that, me calling him on the phone was fear. I didn't know what he would do to me face to face, exactly. And, um, and um, his reaction was very much what I had anticipated it being, which was, good luck, you know, have a nice life. And, and so here I was at 17, I'm six months pregnant, I've never had prenatal care, and I had the clothes on my back, literally. After you had your baby boy, mm -hmm. you went to work in every sense of the word. You somehow found it within you to realize where you were. It's okay, this is where I'm at. I'm going to work and you got a great job. Yeah. A miracle job. I was homeless at the time and a family a took me A friend in. of yours Yeah, a family in. friend took me in. They, uh, her parents did and and so thank God for them. And how important was that? Oh. For somebody just, to finally accept you where you were, and, as you were. It's so true. Just that um, feeling like I belonged somewhere. So I give birth to this bouncing baby boy. I don't even remember having held a, a baby before I had him. So I have this, this kid. I'm now 18 and um, I moved into the project and I got on food stamps and welfare and I got this little actually at the my first job was at a local pizza joint and so I was um, you know I'm, I'm waiting tables um, full-time during the day and I'm going to college full-time at night and my second job was a little furniture store and I was making about $900 a month at that time um, in the midst of all of that I have a second child and so here I was 19 with two kids and um, the most alone I'd ever been. Um, and I often tell the story that I was as close to suicide as I had ever been before or since. And so that was what kind of led me back to church. It was out of desperation, not out of this longing to know the Lord more intimately. Um, if I'm being honest, it was just, I had nothing. Well, when you went back to church, you made a decision to tithe. Mm -hmm. out of what little, mm -hmm. you said you had almost nothing. Yeah. And you begrudgingly felt like God was saying tithe. Yeah. But you said that was a turning point for you. I don't want to in any way insinuate that that um, because I began to tithe that somehow um, God plucked me up out of my misery and um, delivered me to this six-figure income. The tithe was never about that. It was never about what I was going to get from God. It was about this full submission that He had done everything for me. I had to begin to submit everything in my life. My heart, my finances, my parenting, um, my love life, my emotions, all of that had to be fully surrendered for God to do what it was that he's done over the last several decades of my life. When you went to that job that you w that you finally went to where you were able to begin to start to make real money, yeah. 55 million in sales, yeah. I mean, you're, you're put in a situation where it doesn't just happen for you, but you take hold of the opportunity and you really learn the value of work. I would work 60 to 80 hours a week, literally, and my, my kids were young and I would spread out a blanket on the floor on Saturdays and Sundays when we were closed and I would just call people because the job was sales. And the Lord was really doing a work in my heart in a lot of ways as well. I had left that seven year relationship behind um, with the father of my children and that Which was, was a, a huge breakthrough. Oh, I 
struggle to let go because I wanted my children to have what I never did. Transferred into Baton Rouge, met my husband, my now husband Jeff, and um, transferred into New Orleans, got a promotion there. And so it just eventually was just kind of um, the Lord's favor. Well, and you're experiencing success. You're out making big deals. You know, mm -hmm. you're in a whole different world. Yeah, here. yeah. And life is better in a lot of ways but you never forgot. I had my white picket fence, my happily ever after. My husband uh, adopted my two children. We had a third child together. Um, I, was, I had financial success. I literally had everything regarding the American dream that most of us think we want. But um, standing in my church on a Sunday morning worshiping, I was reminded of the darkest day and that I was called to do more. The darkest moment of our life is the one that the Lord will use mightily. And then I started this little Bible study with my church's blessing in my house. I didn't know what I was teaching or saying, yeah. but I just, I, I, a lot of it was. We can make it. Yes. Sometimes it's just, it was just camaraderie. It. It, was, it was like, I want you to know that somebody knows what it's like, what you're going through. And I want you to know that somebody cares. Within a period of six to eight months, it just was far greater than I had ever anticipated it being. You started this ministry in your living room, support group mm -hmm. and fast forward to today. How have you been able to affect a ministry so much that God not only has favored it, but it's been so successful? You know, the transparency of sharing your story with people is important. People need to know where you've been and why you care. The goal of the local church has to be to meet people where they are which is exactly the ministry that Jesus modeled for us. Um, and I think that's why the Life of a Single Mom Ministries has been successful is because of that model of meeting folks where they are. If they know that a broken young single mom who had two children outside of marriage or who uh, endured years of sexual assault, if they know that I made it, and they know that the only way that I made it is through the blood of Jesus that saved me and the freedom that He gave me, then it's worth it to do what I do. One of the best ways to change a community quickly is by helping single moms get on their feet. They struggle, as you've seen in Jennifer's story. Right now, go to lifeonpurpose.tv and look for ways to help Jennifer and her team at Life of a Single Mom Ministries.